So the the kind of other justification that you might give, and the one that I found really interesting, uh, was saying if things can come into existence out of nothing, um, that is if you deny the first premise, then, then why doesn't it happen all the time, right? Why don't things begin to exist out of nothing all the time? Now, my first thought was to say, how do we know that they don't, right? Because to, to come into being out of nothing <laughs> would surely imply coming coming into existence not within the universe, because everything in the universe is not nothing, as we've said. And so to come into being out of nothing, it would have to somehow come into being outside of the universe, and therefore we wouldn't observe it. So maybe it is happening all the time, but we wouldn't be able to observe it by definition. Yeah. Here, I think you're making the same mistake that we talked about earlier when you spoke of the horse coming into being in the living room. Yeah. Thinking that therefore it's not out of nothing. And what I explained there was that I'm saying uh, without an efficient cause. That's what I mean by out of nothing. Um, so if things could come into being without an efficient cause, it seems inexplicable why things aren't just popping into existence all around us, things of different sorts, because they don't need efficient causes to bring them into being. This was an argument that A.N. Pryor uh, mm. developed, and I found it just completely convincing. So um, let, let me, uh, how, how can I, how can I put this? Um, a horse, how about an argument like this? Now, I've, I've, I've heard what I think might be this kind of line of argumentation from you before, but I don't want to put words in your mouth. So if someone were to say something like, and it, it seems absurd on the surface, but if they said something like, well, what if it's the case that universes are the only thing which can come into being out of nothing, right? It, it, a horse can't come into being out of nothing, but, but there's something about the universe. And we already know that the universe is a special kind of something compared to everything within the universe. It, it seems to kind of have the, we, we need to think about it in a different way. Yeah. Yeah. Could we not say something like, well, maybe things do come into being all the time, except the only thing that can come into being out of nothing is a universe, and therefore we wouldn't be able to observe it? Um, as Ian Pryor said, prior to its existence, the universe doesn't exist so as to constrain what can come into being or not. So you can't say that only things of a certain kind can come into being without efficient causes, because without their causes, there just isn't anything to constrain it. Uh, so I don't think that you can say that only certain kinds of things can come into being without efficient causes. Yeah, now the argument that I didn't want to put it in your mouth was one that I've heard elsewhere. People would say the argument that the reason you can't say that only universes can, can come into being out of nothing is because nothing doesn't have any properties and so therefore can't have a kind of preference for universes over other things. Yeah. Um, my my response to that was to say, what if the what if the, the, the necessity of it being a universe is not a property of the nothing, but a property of the thing? And, and let me explain myself. If, for example, um, if we human beings create a circle it has to be round, right? We can't create a square circle. Right. But that's not due to a property of us. That's due to a property of the circle, right? Um, yeah. So in the same way, although nothing has no properties and so can't prefer universes, what if it can only, what, what if only universes can come from nothing because of a property of the universe, not because of a property of nothing? Right. Well, that's, that is exactly what you would have to say because yeah. as you say, properties only inhere in existing things, beings have properties, not non-being. So you'd actually say it's an inherent property of the universe that it can spring into existence without a cause. And I just <laughs> don't make sense of that. Uh, Which sounds absurd. Something that doesn't exist come into existence without a cause because it has a property after it's <laughs> existence. Yeah, I, I mean, it uh, sounds strange, but the, the, the reason why I think it, it, it's useful to think in, in those terms, or at least of, of the possibility of it happening, is because specifically the objection that why don't things pop into existence all the time? I suppose what I'm trying mm -hmm. to do is make a, at least a far-fetched case. I, I'm trying to show at least a, yeah. a possibility that things could come uh, into existence out of nothing and yet 
by definition, we'd be incapable of, of witnessing it. So maybe things do come into existence out of nothing all the time, but because these are only universes, we'll never be able to observe it, we'll never yeah. be able to see well, it. Let, let me commend you for your method, Alex, because by pushing these questions, what you help the atheist to see is the intellectual price tag yes. of his atheism. And I think that's very valuable. You, you, one of the goals of the Christian apologist will be to try to raise the intellectual price tag of non-belief. And if huh. non-belief or non-theism requires me to be a myriological nihilist, to uh, think that things have an intrinsic property that they can come into being that other things don't have, this is all raising the intellectual price tag of non-belief. For me, at least, Alex, just way, way beyond <laughs> what I'm willing to pay. That, and so that's helpful that you're doing this. That, that is a really, really interesting way of thinking about apologetics and, and the argument that we're having is kind of like, you know, what's the better deal here, right? Because both worldviews seem at least consistent, but you've got to ask yourself, you know, how much you're willing to sacrifice of your intuitions, how much you're willing to sacrifice of the beliefs that you um, think are true in order to, to hold to those conclusions. And, and the key point is taking, taking the justifications that we're giving and showing what they lead to. 